director of SUSE Labs Data and Performance, if you haven't seen my face before. Um, this is probably the third time I've given a talk like this, though the last time was nearly four years ago. Um, so there are some changes, but uh, if you've been using it for a while, a lot of it will still look familiar. If you have any questions as I'm speaking, please feel free to interrupt. Um, or if you're not comfortable doing that, there'll be a Q&A session at the end. So let's get started. Oops, how do I? There we go. So this is just a quick overview of how we're going to go through this. Um, there's a bit of legacy around all the tools that we already know and use, like Crash. Uh, a bit of the history of GDB, uh, covering what the development of Crash Python does, and then a demo and Q&A. So the challenges of developing a kernel debugger are that it is sort of a unique application. It's the only thing that controls, uh, it's, oh, it's an application that has control over the entire system's memory, but it's divided up into process size chunks, sort of like how a regular process would have threads, but uh, ends up being vastly semantically different because uh, there's no standardized format, at least that general purpose debuggers are using to look at them. Um, the uh, make dump file can produce an elf header uh, for the dump, but it's not actually a, a classic core dump. Um, those have a defined format. Um, the pages are filtered in the same way that kernel crash dumps are, but there's no compression. The kdump format has been optimized to um, dump much bigger amounts of memory much more efficiently, um, as well as being able to, to clear some out, uh, to filter those pages out a little bit more efficiently. Um, the other challenge is that semantic debuggers need constant care and feeding. Every time there's an upstream kernel change that uh, is visible via a structure or anything like that, especially something that uh, is either part of the core or part of a feature that the semantic debugger already covers, then you'll need to introduce a change in the debugger to, to accommodate that. And we've seen that over the years. So we all know Crash. It's the de facto debugger for the Linux kernel. Initial support for crash dumping landed in 1999 uh, between SGI and mission, mission Critical Linux. I don't know the exact history there. Net and disk dumping was added by Red Hat in 2002 and 2004. We know this tool. It's powerful, but the interface is arcane. It has lots of uh, really good commands to dig out uh, a bunch of different types of data, but it's nearly impossible to script or automate. And that means repeatable sessions are kind of a pain. The extensions, while it can be extended, they have to be done by modifying the source or via extensions that are also written in C. Now I want to put a big asterisk here because I know there's the Pi KDump uh, pack, uh, project out there. But if you look at how it's implemented, it's clear that it's not considered a first class part of Crash. It's not well integrated. It basically needs to override Crash internals for it to work, which kind of gives me the, the, uh, the belief that over time, it's going to become more and more fragile. The other thing with Crash is that it's not Crash architecture. So we have GDB. GDB is the most popular Linux debugger for C programs or C-like programs because it's not just for C. It's a fully symbolic interface for data presentation and command execution, which means every time that there's an address, you get a name that goes along with it. You can reference things by name. You can get the types for them. Uh, your stack traces have all the local variables and parameters. Uh, it's, it's easy to drill down into things as long as the stack is not completely smashed. That's one of the advantages that the crash has is it's much more tolerant of broken stacks. Uh, GDB needs things to be pretty close to what they should be. But in my experience over 20 plus years of debugging kernels, that's pretty much how it usually is. There's not a lot of occasions where I've had a completely broken stack that GDB wouldn't have been able to use. It's been around for decades and is still actively developed. The biggest project that I've seen happening, you know, in the past five years or so, maybe longer now, is the slow migration uh, from the sort of object-like oriented C that we use in the kernel to actual C++. And that's made a bunch of things much more friendly to use. There's less more macro messes uh, and uh, things like inheritance just work. It uses a stacked target approach, which means that you can have multiple targets at different levels. Uh, there's more than the three I show here, but for the most part, these are the only ones we need to care about. The file uh, target is really just 
where do you get your symbols? What's the code look like? It's the executable, the debug info that describes it. Uh, that's how it gets the stack unwinding information. That's how it gets uh, all the symbols. The process uh, target is usually what you'd consider a core dump. It's just the, the memory contents without any sort of uh, visibility into them. And then there's the thread target, which is on top, which divides that memory space into you know, different areas for different threads, gets for register dumps, and the whole works. Lastly, GDB doesn't support kernel crash dumps. It's kind of a de facto standard format now, but it's really just because of the code that wrote it. So Petr Tesejic, uh years ago, thank you, Peter, uh, Petr, uh, wrote libkdump file. And as part of a Hack Week project, he extended it to have a Python interface, which, and I'll get into this a little bit later, but early on, the, uh, the entire plan was to use a Python target and bridge to libkdump file. Um, this time around, I decided to revisit it. And uh, libbfd, which is part of GDB, is an old library uh, that you know keeps getting minor updates, but it's how GDB abstracts file formats. So if you go through it, it's got like every arcane, uh, whether it's an object file that's you know hasn't been used in 30 years, or elf core dumps, or uh, NetBSD core dumps that haven't been seen. It, it just everything is it, it's the classic object like oriented C code where you have a bunch of vectors that you implement different functionality. But ultimately, it's a simple interface, especially when you're using core dumps, because it just needs to know how to break it up into sections. It needs to know how to find certain things. Um, you don't need to go and write uh, the components that would be required to write the, uh, the core dump, because uh, GDB and bin utils and everything else in that suite is never going to write one itself, so you don't need to add it. The plus side is that we can use that interface to synthesize what an elf, elf core dump looks like. And that means having .reg sections or .reg slash CPU sections um, that contain the register dumps. And since these aren't big, we can just load those into memory and make it look like those are part of the, the core file from the beginning. And GDB is none the wiser. We can present the memory using both virtual and physical addresses. And I do that just by naming the sections with uh, either fizz or kv fizz and uh, the starting address. And that works. I mean, the, the names aren't important uh, to GDB. If you look at, uh, if you do info files when you debug a regular executable, you'll find that um, half, the segment, or half the sections are just named load whatever, and that's it, and it doesn't matter. Um, it does a little bit of semantic work because it does have to load up, but it's semantic work in terms of what's in the crash dump. It doesn't uh, do anything with the kernel really. But it pulls out the UTS name, which is in the VM core info. It pulls out the registers and that's about it. It's pretty simple. And all this allows GDB to use it just as a regular core file, just how you'd use it with a regular program and the whole works. And at this point, when we, if we open up an executable and we open the core file, we'll get the memory contents and the registers for the first CPU just so it's not completely empty. But that's it. It's not very useful for our purposes yet. So when I first gave this talk, GDB 7 was actually pretty new. Um, now it's GDB version 12, and the Python interpreter has been part of GDB for <laughs> most of recent history. But initially, it was for pretty printers and uh, to do some functionality that you know you, the developers wanted to allow people to extend. That's evolved somewhat into allowing more semantic behavior. So if you ever had to debug Python code that crashed the interpreter, um, which as it turns out is part of this project I have, uh, it allows you to present the Python objects uh, as Python objects. So you don't need to drill into the Py object types and all that. It just interprets them and then shows you, oh, this is a blah type and uh, these are the values. And it's a lot more easy to work with. And that's sort of what we're looking for for the kernel to a certain extent. Um, you can extend it and implement GDB commands, which uh, for Crash Python, all of them are prefixed with Py, but that they don't need to be. And it presents an API to drill into all of the GDB objects internally, like types and symbols and values and stack traces. And you can access all of those through Python, which lets you build powerful tools that you can use again and again because you can just load them up again. And that's a game changer compared to Crash. Um, 
This is still powerful, but it's incomplete for use as a kernel debugger because we don't have the stack traces yet. We don't have the threads yet. We don't have most of the things that we need. We just have a big empty memory space and some symbols, and that's it. And the important bit about debugging the kernel is that a lot of these symbols need special interpretation. So for example, per CPUs, if you load up a per, the section that is supposed to be for per CPUs, it doesn't actually have a load address. It has a bunch of symbols in it, but that, that section ends up being repeated over and over in memory and the debugger has no idea that that's happening. So even though we have this, this powerful Python implementation, it's limited. Uh, it's never really been tested on a project the size of the kernel, uh, which you can see when you start comparing types with variable lengths arrays, because uh, they'll, even if you have identical objects, they'll fail, because uh, by definition, the variable length array, array will fail it. Uh, the type comparisons, by default, go deep, even for pointer types, which means if you want to compare the types for, say, task struct, you're going to be there for a while, because it follows all the pointers, and that structure gets big fast. There's no interface to find some common things that we use in the kernel. So, for example, anytime you see something in, say, the linker, like a linker script, where uh, it's going to put a bunch of values and bound them between, like, a start and an end, there's no type information for those labels in the linker script. It's just a minimal symbol. It's a name with an address, and that's it. There's nothing else. And the Python interface has no concept of minimal symbols. Looking up, <clears throat> excuse me, looking up types and static symbols requires a block. Actually, looking up types and symbols generally requires a block, but the C APIs don't internally. If you pass it null, then it will just search until it finds something. And I'd like the Python interface to do that as well, so now it can just pass none instead, and it works. There's no way to determine whether a real symbol table has been loaded. So especially with our kernels, when, where we have a separate debug info, if we weren't able to load that, GDB wouldn't be able to tell us. We'd, we'd, there's some heuristic ways you can figure it out, but ultimately it's not very fun. And it's a simple thing to add because GDB does know it internally. There's limited visibility into the exceptions that GDB has. So there's a bunch of them like not available error or, uh, I mean, that's the big one. Um, and it, ultimately you just get GDB error, which you can't do anything with. That could be, um, a thrown exception for something that broke internally. That could be a uh, memory that couldn't be read. It could be a transfer error for some other reason, and you just have no idea. Uh, and that's useful to have when you're trying to figure out what your failure cases are. And there's no first class way to associate data with threads. Sure, you can take a, a data structure in Python and just have a dictionary that uh, maps a task struct to whatever arbitrary data you want to put with it. But ultimately, what you want to do is take a thread, get data for it, and that's it. And there's no way to do that easily. So most of the problems I just described are solved. Um, the, the solutions aren't super advanced, so I didn't really need to get in, into them here. But the version of GDB that I have has those fixed. And over time, I'd like to get those upstream. And compared to the last time I gave this top, talk, there are actually quite a few fewer uh, changes required to GDB. I've re-architected it a little bit so that uh, the internals aren't exposed quite as much as they used to be. So the way that we, we connect Python to all the things that we want to do for the kernel debugger are to expose a target that can be implemented in Python. Initially, I was inspired by Kieran Bingham's work to interface with remote embedded boards. And that, I believe that's still work that he's doing. And practically, I ended up rewriting a lot of it because my use case was entirely different and I needed to extend it in different ways um, and as I did that, I started cleaning stuff up, and it bears very little resemblance to the initial work anymore. Um, the early versions of Crash Python use this to connect GDB to libkdump file to create a kdump target. Now, this was separate from the Crash stuff. This was just uh, just bringing up the, the, the core file, just like I, I can now with the core command, but that's it. And it needed to be a separate module because otherwise, uh, the interdependencies ended up getting really painful to manage, so I didn't do that. Um, it's not used directly anymore. The GDB target is still uh, there. It's still the base of what I'm using now. But connecting libkdump file to GDB via Python meant uh, bidirectional translation through Python every time, every time there was an I.O., which is kind of slow. And 
it also, like I just said, re required exporting internals to Python, which not only got messy, but also it's a pretty big limitation trying to get things upstream. If you start exporting things that, yes, they make sense for my kernel debugger project, but all of a sudden you're uh, exporting section names from a language that doesn't care about them. And I wasn't really looking to dig into the internals of GDB that much. So now we have the GDB Linux kernel target. This extends the, the uh, C part of the Python target at the C, C++ level to implement a new target in about 500 lines of code. Um, mostly it just tries to stay out of the way. It provides services that access the internals so that we don't need to expose them. And that allows us to open and validate the target so you know you're not going to have uh, all these weird failure cases when you have a uh, Linux kernel target on top of some random thing. It needs to be a core dump or kcore eventually, which I haven't done yet. Um, and otherwise, it will just say, nope, don't know what that is. It will look up some initial types that it, that'll need to iterate later, like task struct, list head, those sorts of things. It will relocate the kernel in per CPU regions, which is a lot nicer to do this way because having to expose all that stuff uh, was a mess. The way it used to work is I'd, I'd construct a big add symbol file command line and uh, hope for the best. And it worked for the most part, but it's not ideal. And the per CPU stuff needs to happen after you've already relocated the kernel once. So it's basically relocating parts of the kernel multiple times. And then it also populates the thread list from the crash kernel's task list. Um, this does the bare minimum. It takes uh, the task list and uh, iterates over it, gets an address, creates a thread for it with the PID that's, that it found in the task struct, and then adds a pointer to it so that we can find it later when we want to flesh it out with Python code. And the nice part about this is that it's all architecture and kernel version independent, unless, you know, suddenly we're not using a list of task structs, then we'll have to do something. Um, but otherwise, there's nothing particularly special in there. And so then we have, uh, well, that, that's all GDB stuff. Now we're in the Crash Python stuff, which is where the fun stuff is. Now, it's a full program, you have full programmatic access to memory, register, stack traces, type, symbols, everything, which means you can uh, automate some stack searches, which I have a, now that I have the, the screen sharing, I can show an old uh, case that I use for that. And arbitrary iteration and filtering, which means you don't need to take your output from crash and pipe it through set and awk and then turn it into new commands and iterate until you hope you get it right and you know hope something didn't get copy pasted wrong at the, the wrong point. It's also easily extensible at runtime by a Python to add new commands, to enhance the subsystems, or even just to run quick runoffs so that you don't need to type them over and over. You just, you know, source test.py and you get a reproducible series of commands. And this has been hugely, po uh, hugely powerful. Even just the, the running simple commands or simple scripts because you can, you can iterate the development of them. And, you know, it can take you, you know, an hour or half hour or whatever to write one of these things. But then when you run into a similar problem later, you can just reuse it or you, you can clean it up and turn it into a new command. Um, that's what the, the XFS command does, for example. It did so, it contains some things that I wrote up as uh, just quick little one-offs to gather data. And we covered some of these already, but these are the changes since the last time I gave this talk in 2018. We're using GDB 12.1 now. It starts up much faster and that is mostly due to uh, not uh, reevaluating every one of the delayed, the delayed lookups whenever a module is loaded. And so now, even with a decent sized crash dump, it takes 30 seconds to start up. And that includes loading all the modules, loading all the tasks, everything. It supports only Python 3.6 and above now. And the reason for that is 3.5 added typing, which caught so many bugs. And 3.6 added F strings, which are a lot nicer to work with than the old uh, well, either of the old uh, Python formatting. Uh, it can do full lint and typing checks now, so you can try to find, you can have it find bugs before you even see them. Um, and now the project should pass all of them out of the box. I've added support for compressed modules, and that's both gzip and uh, uh, zstd. And the way that works is it just creates a tree of decompressed modules and reads them in. 
and cleans them up afterwards. Um, I've also updated it to support for the existing subsystems up to Linux 5.14. It probably can do newer than that now, but I haven't tested it lately. Um, and that's mostly just small type changes, things like that, detecting little changes. But also since the last time we gave this talk, uh, I've merged features from a bunch of different people. So Petr Emledek uh, submitted lockless print case support, which was really slick. Uh, Mikko Kutney sub, uh, submitted C group support. Blastemil uh, submitted slub support. And Yankara submitted support for the multi key block layer. And so all these things are really necessary to, to be using a modern kernel. And thank you for your contributions. This is the other half of the target. So rather than having uh, the, the KDOM target try to do all the stuff and have to pass back and forth and all of that, the way it works now is that we have a crash target architecture target. And this is the target that gets used by GDB directly. There's an architecture independent base, base class that does most of the basics. This is what KDump used to do. Um, and it does the, the lifting in terms of setting up the tasks in a usable format. So GDB itself will populate its own thread list, which, so if you do info threads, you'll get all the threads on the system. You can get back to, actually at that point, you can't get back traces. Um, and, it provides an abstract class, which is a template for architecture support. And the reason it is, is because if you try to instantiate a Python class that has outstanding abstracts, it will fail. And so when you're putting together a new target and you're missing something, you'll see it pretty quickly. Each architecture fills these in and then finishes setup for itself. So for example, um, the, the uh, memory ranges on PowerPC are different than the memory ranges on x86. And that's where you set that stuff up so that you limit the size, you limit your stack traces so you're not uh, you know, crossing back into user space where you don't care. It's kernel, the kernel version dependent components are mixed in. Uh, and mix, mix-ins are a, a Python thing where um, it's sort of like multiple inheritance, but you're just pulling in chunks of classes instead. You have these classes that are just uh, only implement a few methods, and those methods get added into the, the built class. So uh, you can have your... Uh, fetch registers uh, for the scheduled ones on x86, there are two different ways to do it. And so it will just create targets for both kinds and then uh, use the callbacks to figure out uh, which one is actually present on the system. And the one that isn't doesn't get loaded. It'll iterate through each of them trying to load them until one succeeds. And now that we have uh, the, uh, the rest of the target implemented, which brings up register uh, population, now we actually do have the symbolic backtraces and we can do drill in the same way you would for any other process. Um, but like every step we've seen so far, it's useful, but we still only have GDB commands. Uh, we don't have, uh, actually I think at this point we probably do have per CPUs, but we, we don't have PS. We don't have uh, the ability to see the kernel log. We can't iterate over data structures automatically with a nice slick UI or uh, API. Uh, this is just print and start digging through things yourself. Or you can you know, write your own scripts, but half the point of the project is that you don't need to. So as you start putting together uh, code to, to use Crash Python, there are a number of technologies that make it easier to use. Delayed lookups are probably one of the most fundamental ones. And that is so that you don't need to check to see if something exists all the time. Um, if you look at some of the code that, uh, Python code that accesses uh, Linux kernel structures already, there's lots of uh, conditionals in order to make it work and it gets kind of painful. So instead, what I do is declare the requirements up front. Um, some of them can be optional and it will use the names to look up and populate collections. And so those will be uh, just classes where the attributes are named after whatever object you're looking up which I'll get to in the next couple of slides. The contents are loaded as they become available. And if by chance you're on a, a crash dump that doesn't have what you're looking for, you'll get a delayed attribute uh, error out of it. And you can use that to, to back off and pick something else and then not have to constantly do the conditionals. It can also declare arbitrary callbacks, which I'll have a, a, a quick example of later, which is useful to select things uh, and do those mix-ins uh, in other scenarios so that you don't have to uh, do all the lookups. It's just, it'll check it, it'll put it in place, and you're good to go. Uh, 
So this is delayed lookups for types. I hope that the coloring comes through. I just wanted to make it clear uh, which is user provided and which is uh, output. And this will just look up types, a list head and a list head pointer. Now you can see, I can use my pointer now. Uh, here, this is just, it responds with the GDB type. So if you took a GDB, uh, the GDB module itself in Python and did a lookup type, this is what you get back. But instead of having to do the lookup uh, and check it over and over the way you would normally, you just get it out of the types collection and you're good to go. Uh, you can see the name of it. You can see the size of it because this is part of what GDB type does. And if you're using a pointer, you just add an underscore P to the end of the type. And I believe it will keep adding underscore P's for every uh, level of indirection. For symbols, it's similar. We look up the symbol by name. You can just put the names up here. Uh, you'll get, uh, this is just a, a GDB symbol type. And at this point, it's a name that refers to an address. It has some type information. But if you want the value, you need to call value on it. And then you'll get the actual value in it. SimVals end up being a little bit more useful. Symbols are useful when you need to make sure the object actually exists uh, or is reachable. SimVals are when it's OK to just dereference it and uh, get the end result. So we get, uh, this is the equivalent of the value here. It just stores that instead of having to do dot value every time. And this is how you get the address down here. And otherwise, if you just access it, you'll get the value of it automatically, especially if it's like a, an integer or a pointer type. You can, it'll cast it automatically uh, to the integer. And that's something that GDB does itself. And so here's an example of how we use the callbacks. This is uh, in the task setup stuff where we're trying to figure, actually, no, this is in the um, uh, block layer uh, where we want to get the usual request flags. And we can populate them automatically based on what we know in the kernel. Uh, the, the, one, the names that we use regularly are, are macros, but they're based off of enums. And so we can use the enum to reconstruct the macros and then use the same names that we'd use in the kernel code. And all this happens automatically without having to, to open code it every time. More powerful stuff. Uh, th this is where the semantic stuff comes in. It uh, has an understanding of atomics, bitmaps, class devices, per CPUs, where you can either get uh, the value on a particular CPU or iterate over them. It will iterate over collections of uh, list head lists, K lists, RB trees, bitmaps, including scannable, uh, scalable bitmaps, online and possible CPUs. And this can be extended easily. But the most powerful stuff is the subsystem APIs. Now, you know me, my background's in file system and storage, so I've put the most work there uh, to, uh, as a result of investigating bugs. And then I just iterated it until it became something I could use over and over. So we can iterate over mounts and super blocks, over request queues. Uh, there are file system specific helpers, so you can uh, dump the XFS journal, for example, or uh, the outstanding buffers. Um, and one of the most powerful things I, I came up with over the past couple of years was the ability to unwind the storage stack uh, from, at, say, you have a stuck request and you have a system call that is, uh, it's not really related because it's waiting, it's, it's, uh, it's issued the, the request and it's not waiting for it. But you can see what it's waiting for eventually. Um, and this will actually step through the storage stack. So if at the bottom you have uh, just a request queue, it is a SCSI device. Uh, and then, you know, three layers of device mapper on top of it, whether it's uh, multipath and linear and maybe something else. And then there's a file system on top of that. And then you get what file is being accessed. And it will do all of that automatically using the end IO routines as a key to figure out what the next label, level up is. And that, that ended up being really slick to figure out what was stuck on the system and why. Uh, there's been a lot of contribution from other developers for memory management helpers to iterate over pages, zones, nodes, and uh, some secret functionality that I haven't actually been able to play with yet. The built-in commands, um, I don't want to go through each of these, uh, but the XFS command, for example, is how you basically codify some of the things that you come up with on your own and uh, turn those one-off scripts into commands. PyTask and PyPS are probably the ones you'll use the most. 
Um, and that's just, you know, what you'd see in Crash, except uh, I, you select the task and get the backtrace for it. OK, does anybody have any questions before we go to the demo or any requests uh, for functionality you'd like to see? OK, then I will start it up. Now, this is a dump I collected this morning. It's a SLEE 15 SP4 host, I think. Um, I just ran a stress test script that uh, does a bunch of copies and deletes and checksums in a loop. Um, this particular test had 16 loops running. Um, and you can see, as we drill down, uh, what it came up with. So this is obviously a stack trace. This is the, the crashed uh, task. This is me doing echo C to CISRQ trigger. Um, and so we can see, let's uh, drill down to say, um, actually. We can see the, the register dump, at least at this level. We can see the register dump that GDB sees. And as we're getting higher in the stack, we can see more and more. Yeah, yeah, Petter, I was pretty surprised how uh, Petter Tezhajic is commenting about how fast it is now. And it's, yes, it is much faster than it used to be. <laughs> and so this is just switching to uh, another task that I know is going to be active in ButterFS. Uh, by default, it's only going to show you the first frame. So you'll see just the switch to, which is uh, the last bit of the scheduler before it switches tasks. And so we can see it's a, an unlinked syscall, goes through the entire stack. Let's go up to, say, frame 8. And this is the, this is the danger of using uh, an optimized kernel, <laughs> because there's often not a lot less left. Is that actually what I wanted? I forget what the, is it arg? And so we can see the, the ButterFS root, fully symbolic uh, for all of it. We want to see. get it just like you're using C code. Um, and we can demonstrate some commands. I don't have an XFS file system mounted on this machine, so I couldn't, I can't really demo that. This one still takes a little while, and I'm not sure why. But this will list all of the mounted file systems. It's probably path name resolution that takes a while. Oh, that's unexpected. So just this is a this is actually the host that I've been developing the security sensor on. So there's lots of Docker noise. I it's a bit clear I don't know how to use that command. And that'll just dump the entire config from uh, what would back proc config.gz. And so we can look at what some of this code looks like. So for a command like, say, uh, the dev command, this is what will appear. The, the uh, module doc string will appear as the help text. So if I did. You get that. 
weird. And implementing a command is as simple as uh, adding a parser if you need one. Um, actually, I think you need to at least have an empty one. Um, and then an execute callback, where you'll get um, the args that were parsed from the command itself. And then you can just do whatever you want. You can see that this is a really simple command. It just takes um, the output of for each disk. which just iterates over each block device using uh, the disk type, which is uh, in contrast to partition type. And then this builds, I believe, on the yep, for each class device and only returns the types that we want. And you can see how the functionality just expands and builds on the lower levels. Enzo is asking if there's anything ready for the network stack. And the answer is no, not that I'm aware of. Um, I don't do much work in the networking space personally, and so I haven't had an opportunity to develop it. But if anybody has been using Crash Python to do some of these things and has code they'd like to contribute, please let me know. OK. And so we can. this is the you know usual stuff that we see in the kernel, if I can figure out where that is. Oops. And so you have the helpers that you're used to seeing when you're developing in the kernel. And so a lot going on in the XFS one. And some basic stuff like just listing the file systems. Um, showing some basic information about a particular file system, being able to dump the active item log. Um, and again, this is the, the best way that I've found to develop these commands is to start developing the subsystem helpers. So we can go to the XFS subsystem. And all of these things can be called directly if you want to write up your own uh, debugging tool that will iterate over, say, the events in the log or anything like that. You don't need to iterate over the output of command. You can just use it directly. And so you can see this is uh, from a, uh, an actual bug uh, that I was working on years ago um, that I had to develop these. Uh, the advantage over, uh, Matthias Brugger is asking, what's the advantage over Dragon? And it's a different kind of tool. Um, the biggest advantage is that uh, it's the familiar GDB interface under the hood. Um, and it takes advantage of a lot of code that's already written. Um, I haven't been digging into Dragon lately. And I, I was initially and was looking at porting some of this stuff over to it. Um, but ultimately decided to stay where it was because uh, a lot of the helpers just don't translate really easily. Um, the, I think the biggest thing is that Dragon is really targeted at live systems, um, which can be powerful. Uh, but it also has a very different set of constraints. So we can do a lot of caching on in, in Crash Python because if we are primarily working on crash dumps. So nothing's going to be changing underneath you. You don't need to reload to, to update your state. Um, and at this point, it's just that I'm more familiar with it. And I try to keep the interface as familiar to Crash as I can. Uh, to minimize the amount of time required to learn it. This one is one of my favorites, because this was an issue years ago where uh, I had an, uh, a system that looked to be hung, but it turned out it wasn't. And there were 6,000 threads or something like that, all waiting on XFS, but not waiting in the same, on the same things. Um, and so this loop here goes over every thread in the system, every thread in the dump. And as we dig into it, this loop goes through every stack frame on every task in the system. And it's hunting out particular things. So 
if it's uh, scheduled. Actually, no, that's not scheduled. I, for, I forget how this would actually come up. Um, but if it's an F put, I can grab the inode. And um, in that particular case, all of the stack traces were had the inode locked. So I could uh, isolate that. Uh, or no, that was, I think, what was releasing it. Um, we could see which ones were being created. And it's it's piecing through every uh, stack trace, every stack frame on the system, uh, correlating things. This loops through the entire XFS log and sees what items are being pinned and uh, what ends up uh, waiting on it. And so you can see here, we're seeing um, which inodes are locked, which ones are pinned. And it took me probably an hour and a half or so to write the script and then 30 seconds to run it. And the outcome was that the system wasn't locked up at all. It was, the system was all backed up waiting behind uh, a single locked buffer, which was the, um, the root node of the allocation group in XFS. And it turned out in this particular case, the system had uh, a few tens of uh, CPU cores in it, but only six allocation groups. And so this ended up being um, a misconfigured file system for the workload. And we were able to advise the customer saying, hey, um, we can help you get out of this because it's uh, you're obviously stuck and it's a, it's a live workload. But the right way to fix this is to reformat your file system with enough allocation groups for your processors. And that, given that we were able to express that concisely, that ended up being a, a, a satisfied customer, even if it wasn't the answer they were looking for. Um, and I think that's most of what I wanted to show. Uh, does anybody have any anything they'd like to see in particular or any questions? I uh, I don't have a camera here, but I'm Vlastimil, and uh, I just wanted to say that I was uh, at Plumbers uh, attending a talk by Philip Rudo from uh, from Red Hat, who, as I understand, is now maintaining Crash uh, after the Anderson guy, I think, retired, and in, and he's actually aware of uh, the problems of Crash and is looking into modernizing it and is trying to go into the direction of Python. And he has some ideas that I'm not convinced are great, like having the semantic info as part of the kernel tree and also uh, relying more on Python without patching GDB if possible. And so I, I was asking if he heard about Crash Python because that would be maybe one platform that we could all agree on and develop in with more manpower and he said that he was considering it and even talking to you i think and but he, I, was, I did. he wasn't really convinced that it's the way but maybe if he saw the new developments he would be more agreeable about going this way instead of trying to do everything in some Python scripts that live in the kernel tree. I t try to tell him that the performance probably wouldn't be great, that you need some of the C extensions to GDB to be upstreamed. So you think it's possible to cooperate? So, so it's not all just a, a like eternal hack week project. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I did hear from him and uh, gave him an outline of uh, what the work I was planning on was. Uh, at that point, it was not real stable yet. So it wasn't really something that I was willing to, to have somebody test. But I should probably reach back out to him and say, hey, this is the state of the art now, and it's working pretty well. Okay, good. Um, I, I definitely welcome contributions, even if I haven't been necessarily the best at accepting them in a timely fashion. Alex wants to know if uh, IRQ and NMI stack traces are available or accessible. Um, that, I believe, is an architectural specific thing, and I haven't 
looked at it too closely. It should be possible to have them as either, we can probably synthesize the stacked frames or um, trampoline them somehow. I haven't looked at that specifically though. Enzo would like to know if it's quick to do, could I demonstrate the code path for a single write from syscall to block bio? And I'm not sure what you're asking there. The I'm sorry? I was saying we are almost at the end of 45 minutes mark, but yeah, if, we, if people are interested. Um, Enzo, could you elaborate on what you're asking for there? Because going from Cisco, uh, syscall to a block bio, um, is a lot easier to do backwards than it is forward. Uh, because if you go forward, it, it depends on the file system you're using. It depends on the block devices you're using. It could be anything. Um, but I'd, I think it's probably out of scope for this call or this uh, presentation, but I'm willing to discuss it afterwards if you'd like. And since I am out of time, I should probably finish up. Um, lastly, uh, links to find the projects. Um, I believe the OBS project should be working now. Um, there was an issue where it was trying to load libkdump file 9 instead of 10, um, and it will, at this point, fail silently, which was sort of by design. Um, and the GitHub project, you're going to want to use this branch because the master branch is still the old stuff. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. I appreciate it, and have a good afternoon. Have a